All right, in today's episode, we're gonna jump in and start seam welding the race car. Let's take a look. All right, so before we jump into the main part of the video, I just wanted to cover two things I've been getting asked a lot on my social media as I've been doing the, the recording of this video. So first is why, why are you seam welding this car? And the second is why didn't you acid dip the car? So on the first, um, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, seam welds are, any, are, are when you weld something like one inch increments or something that, you know, similar to this, anywhere the metal overlaps each other. So here you can see this is a seam between two different parts of the, the stamped body here, and we've we've welded them together. Um, I've, the way we've been doing it is we've been doing about one inch long, one inch gap, one inch long, one inch gap, et cetera, et cetera, and around the whole car. And we've done that for that anywhere there is a seam in the middle that's structural or can benefit from um, being reinforced. And so a question I get a lot on that is why are you doing this to you know a newer car? This is a 2017 Mustang. And the reason being, even though these cars are very strong from the factory, they can still get better. You know, this is something that Ford still does for all their factory race cars that they build. Um, and you can absolutely feel it. I don't have any data to give you on, you know, it adds this much strength and you absolutely need to do it or you don't need to do it at all. I don't have any of that kind of data. We're just tearing the car down this far and I figured this would be an interesting way to do something I've always wanted to do and get better at welding. That was the second is why didn't I acid dip the car? And initially that was because I didn't want to have to repaint the entire car, which I know sounds funny when you're looking at it right now. But ruby red is a tri-coat color. It's super expensive to paint. And at the moment, um, in, until this video, I didn't have any damage anywhere on the, the main body here, so like the roof, the, you know, the, the roof line and, and the rear quarters and stuff. So I thought I could get away with not having to repaint the entire chassis. So I didn't do the acid dip because the acid dip is several thousand dollars on its own. And then of course, probably $10,000 worth of paint to repaint it afterwards. So I was hoping to get away from that. All right, now let's jump into the video. All right, so here's my toolkit for removing sound ender and seam sealer. Basically anything you can find to grind it scrape it or pick it off the heat helps loosen things up when needed you know the the angle grinders here with the various attachments they spin at a great speed they'll chew through seam sealer and, and you know clean up a surface after you've pulled sound deadener off of it the the drill with the various wire wheel attachments are great when you need to get into a much smaller space or get a little deeper down into seams and stuff versus these which you know aren't super flexible and then the picks here allow you to really kind of get in and get that last little bit out and then as you'll see the um the wood chisels make sure you don't use ones you actually plan to use again but wood chisels and scrapers are really really good for the sound dinner part when you really need to just start scraping stuff off as well as they work pretty good if you have a flat surface that you're removing seam sealer from all right so getting started with the sound dinner here you can see for this sheet type that looks like kind of you know just a big sheet of sound dinner a heat gun and a paint scraper works very effectively it comes off much easier but when we get to this stuff which looks like it's you know painted on with a brush or something like that it's much much harder it's much much slower and you really need a lot more heat so this is where your torch will really come in handy obviously I would recommend if you're using the torch to burn stuff you should be wearing a chemical mask I was not here but I do going forward all right so here's a closer look at that stuff and I wanted to show with this one how effective the wood chisels are so you'll see here I get my torch out I add some heat I heat it up pretty good not enough to get it in and glowing red hot or anything but definitely enough to to get it really, really nice and warm. And then you'll see here, the paint scraper just pushes it right off. Super, super easy. So this was by far the most efficient method I found to do this. All right, and moving over to the seam sealer here, you'll see uh, what I found to be most effective is to put a, a lot of heat in and then really just start to work this loose with a wood chisel. Um, you know, you can use the brush, but it makes a huge mess and Honestly, this was just faster and more consistent for me. So this is with the method I went. I used uh, three different sizes of wood chisel, kind of depending on what was, uh, what kind of space I was working in. The really skinny one that you see I'm using here works most effective when you're dealing with compound pieces, but this stuff comes up much better all in one piece, kind of like the, the full width of it. So when possible here, now you'll see that I'm using the much wider uh, wood chisel. I think it's like one inch wide. So if you can use that, I definitely recommend it, but you'll just have to kind of work through what part is most effective. And now you'll see I'm down to the little one, trying to chip away the extra bits and pieces here. So you definitely can use a 
like a, a wire wheel or anything like that but honestly it makes such a mess and it's so hard to get it so consistently off that unless the wood chisel isn't working effectively i would recommend uh starting with the wood chisel because the, the wire wheel is just makes a huge mess and it's a ton of work all right once you get it all scraped up then i went ahead and i would get a, a wire wheel here to do that cleanup just to make sure i get off all the little contaminants you can see how much of a mess this is already making with very little seam sealer left um, which is why i don't like to do it as the the main way to go about it but um it's really i found it's really critical to have a bunch of different types of wire wheels sizes and diameters and and style so that you can really get into all the crevices as necessary you know, it, i use probably about 10 different wheels throughout this project to make sure I could get everything nice and clean. And then just using a pick here right at the end to, to get the seam seal that's a little bit further down into the crack than I'm able to get with a wire wheel. All right, as we headed to the underside of the car, I had to use a combination of an angle grinder with the crimped wire on it, with the, uh, the drill bit, with the wire wheel on it as well as my wood my trusty wood chisel so here in the arches there's just this was so hard to try to scrape the seam sealer off of given the you know the round nature of it so i attacked it with an angle grinder and here under you know kind of where the gas oem gas tank is i was able to use the wood chisel some but i was still using a lot of the angle grinder and then as i get to go down the side of the car like i am now this is where the wood chisel really came in handy again but i just had to use a bunch of different tools to tackle this just to really get the you know the the right amount of right, leverage. now that we have all the sound dender and seam sealer removed um we're getting we're getting ready to jump into uh prepping all the individual seams for welding basically what we need to do is we need to get them all nice and clean and there are no contaminants where we plan to weld so uh essentially you know on the the outer surface or the top surface the bottom surface and then the the seam itself uh, but before I jump into that, I wanted to show you up close on what I essentially I'm going for is I'm going for half an inch to an inch of uh, clean surface on either side of the seam. Reason being is the, the weld heats up this whole area. And if you have paint too close to it, it'll heat up the paint, it'll start to burn, and it'll contaminate the weld. And as you'll see upcoming here, I have a whole bunch of different tools I'm using. But essentially, this is the end result of what we're looking for. Nice, clean, metal. It has no primer left, no seam sealer left, nothing like that, at least that we can see, um, is, you know, that we're able to detect. And sometimes if there's stuff in there, you'll have to get a pick in and, and scrape it out or heat it up or something like that to burn through it. But this is the goal. This is what we're looking to have on every surface that we plan to weld. All right, so here's my toolkit for prepping the seams for stitch welding. Uh, my main guy here was this die angle grinder from Milwaukee. This thing was fantastic at taking off that uh, top layer of paint. I had a couple different ways I'd do it with these little uh, sanding discs as well as you know these paint removal discs here. Both of those worked really, really great. This is just uh, the same deal, another angle grinder, but a, or another die grinder, but this one's straight just for slightly different, um, a little more flexibility. This did about 95% of it. I, I rarely needed this one. My second most used thing were the wire wheels here. You know, these were really critical for getting into those really tight spaces where I couldn't get that thing tight enough and it really did the final cleanup for me. And then this was just a heavy hitter when I needed to use it a few times. And then of course, make sure you're protecting your hands, your lungs, and your eyes, uh, as you definitely don't wanna get hit by any of those uh, wire wheels in face. But uh, one thing on the wire wheels is make sure you, you are using the coarse versions. You know, I had some medium uh, versions of these and they just weren't able to remove the paint. These coarse versions uh, were much, much better and they took paint right off. All right, so I got started here in earnest inside the interior cabin so Dad would have uh, an area to start welding while I finished up the rest of the car. So my workflow was to grab that little Milwaukee angle die grinder, put a two-inch disc on it, and go over every seam in the interior cabin of the car. And that, I would try to get that half inch to an inch on each side of the seam, you know, the top and the bottom of the two materials that were, you know, wedged together or, or tack, tack welded together. And... Then I would go over it with a little, that would do a really good job of getting the majority of it ready to go, but you still needed to get the, the part where the two metals 
um, overlapped, right? There was always material in that actual seam. And so typically what I would do is I would grab the drill and I would put one of my wire wheels on it, you know, my coarse wire wheels, and I would really dig it into that seam to try to get as many contaminations out of it as I could. All right, with most of the cabin prepped, I could let dad loose on it. We played around with a bunch of different settings here, and I'll go over these um, on the actual welder. But essentially, we would get the we'd set the welder for you know 18 16 to 18 to 20 gauge depending on what we were working on and just tweak settings from there and what we found is in the areas that where there was a lot of contamination we really just needed to turn the welder up and move quickly because you got to burn through it um, and, and deal with that but you don't if you don't have enough puddle it just burns right through it so it was a real fine line of trying to find the right amount of puddle to, to burn through stuff and and be able to work through it but not blow out the metal all right, so with Dad let loose inside the interior, mainly focusing here on the firewall, I moved over to the edge of the bay and started prepping all these surfaces. At this point in time, we didn't quite know which you know path we were going to take, you know where Dad was going to go with the welding versus uh, where I was going to go with the prepping. But I knew I could work here while he was working inside the car. Where if I moved to the bottom, I was going to have to lift the car up. So this just made more sense. But I started working here and just trying to get all these seams cleared. These are super important. Uh, seems to get you know really good welds on because these are the shock towers they see a ton of load they see a ton of stress as well as you got the engine in here torquing over and stuff like this so this this part of the car sees a lot of stress and i really wanted to make sure our welds were good here as well as i know this is an area that we're all going to judge so i really wanted to make sure i was prepping it correctly so i put a lot of time in here and then as dad continued to rock and roll um, I popped in and started to take some looks at how stuff was going as well as I w wanted to see, you know, uh, some of the progress he was making and he was getting a little better welds and he was teaching me what he was doing that was a little better, which I'll go over in a little bit. And then I tried to take what he learned and apply it myself. Um, and I was pretty happy with these results for, you know, this is one of the first times I really put in a decent amount of welding in this project. So armed with the knowledge that dad got on the previous day and the, you know, his advice as I, as I took some turns the, you know, the previous day, I jumped in and, and tackled a lot of this passenger side and I was pretty happy with the way it turned out. You know, the, the side there, the outer side, the exterior part is much easier to weld. That's like 16 gauge metal and there's a couple layers of it. So it's really hard to burn through. You can really turn the heat up, get nice clean welds. But as I moved to the floor, the rear part of the floor here, this stuff is stamped. So it's, you know, it's been stretched and bent and all that kind of stuff. And it's much, much thinner. So it's really, really, really hard to get a nice clean weld on this stuff. Super easy to burn out, especially right there around the transmission tunnel. All right. Moving up here to this main support and into the, the rear seat area, fortunately a lot of this metal was thicker so it was much easier for me to weld. So this was actually a really great place for me to spend a decent amount of time because it wasn't nearly as easy to blow out which meant I, you know, my confidence was much stronger and I was getting to play around with the way I, I played with the puddle. And one of the things I, I found out when I was working here is the importance of uh, you know, pushing, not pulling. So you're angling the gun towards the direction you're moving and the puddle is behind it a little bit. And it was really, I found out critical to get a decent sized puddle started and then move that puddle forward versus just aim it forward and start going. That's when I was having blowouts and other issues. So I was really, really happy with how this turned out. All right, I almost didn't include this part just cause it's such a bummer, but it's a good lesson learned here. Uh, for all of us and I think that's a uh, that's worth including but essentially we got rocking and rolling here in the in inside of the car and and started welding up you know this um, back rear seat wheel area and then as we started to work on the wheel wells it seemed like everything was going great you know dad's get in a in a great rhythm the welds look fantastic um, but as you can see here if you start to watch that little square hole over where he was closely um, here it's starting to light up now and you can see there's actually a fire going on in there there was some uh, stuff back there that ended up lighting on fire and, and creating a real mess and it's super unfortunate because we were doing such a good job of keeping things in good shape but unfortunately we got caught out this time well we've had our first casualty slash incident of the build so far uh, we ended up burning through some clear coat, <laughs> some base coat, and pretty much everything else. Um, unfortunately, we were welding the, we were doing our seam welding, uh, going up the wheel well here, and I had no idea, but 
I, I can't even get a camera in there to show you, but like up there on right where it's all black and stuff and you can see there's foam or there was foam, it's all burnt now, but there was foam inside there that caught on fire. So we didn't even know this was there. Um, I didn't think to, to look inside that cavity and up there uh, for foam. But if you are doing something like this yourself, um, pay attention and, and realize that there's foam in there. It's so frustrating because we, we hadn't, we didn't acid dip the car because the cost of repainting the entire car, including the, you know, the nice ruby red here was going to be so substantial that uh, in addition to the, the cost of acid dipping the car itself, I was like, I'll just put the grunt work in and grind it through. But that meant that we had to not damage the body or the paintwork or anything like that through this whole process. And unfortunately, um, we went at it pretty big. <laughs> I was worried and assumed that maybe I'd get a couple scrapes and maybe some bruises. Um, definitely didn't think I was going to uh, mess it up that bad because we are basically at, at the time now where we have to do a full repaint of the car. I mean, theoretically, I guess we could get part of this sprayed, but I'm not sure yet. It's really unfortunate because the only part of this car, this car's seen a lot of track abuse, and the only part of this car that is completely damaged free was the chassis, specifically the rear quarters. So the rear bumper's got some nicks and scrapes in it. The, you know, the front, both front fenders uh, have like holes cut in them and, you know, some, and some scrapes. The one door has had a tire fall on it. The other door had a big, heavy jack fall on it and rub on it as we're driving down the road. And of course the front is all messed up. The front and the hood are all chipped up from the track use. So literally that was the only part of the car that still had good original paint and I just burned through it. So unfortunately we're gonna have to figure out what to do going forward. That's quite unfortunate because I think that means we're gonna have to repaint the whole car now, which definitely adds to the scope and the cost. Damn. And I guess this is just gonna be another reminder, always, always, always check what's on the other side of what you're welding, especially when you're doing something like this. You know, we've been doing a really good job so far at checking what was on the other side of surfaces, you know, when we were welding the floor and the walls and the, you know, and the firewall, as well as making sure we didn't weld too close to the exterior in case we got the material too hot and that we would, you know, warp the, the paint finish on the exterior. But I didn't even think to look up in those cavities because like, why would there be anything there? But apparently there was. So just a reminder, always check where you're welding, always be careful because you can definitely burn your, burn your car and potentially burn your garage down. That could have been really bad if we had left or you know a mistake had been made. So fortunately, it's just a little burnt quarter panel that's gonna cost some money to get repainted and that's all. All right, and so here's a close-up of the welding. You can see with this first one that that push method worked very well for Dad. He got a real great um, run here, no major popping and cracking or blowouts, and things worked really well. But I wanted to include this this shot to show you that not everything was gravy, not every weld was perfect. So in this one, Dad gets going the same exact way that worked an inch earlier, and it starts to work, and then boom, it blows out. So you can see here when that, you know, that those big breaks happen in between, it blows out. So what dad has to do now is fill the hole back up. And the way you do that is you just do a bunch of little tack welds until the hole's nice and filled up. And then you go back over the whole thing. At least that's what we found to work most effective. Because if you uh, have a little blowout and you can fill that hole up and then go over the whole weld again, it'll be a little bigger than the whole, the rest of the welds, but it'll be a clean weld versus, you know, a big messy weld with big gaps and stuff like that so that's how we tackled this and found it to be most effective all right and then this one i want to include just to show you that um, you got to really make sure you're working at a good angle you know one of the things you hear a lot is if you're welding you know test out your welding skills and practice in a whole bunch of different angles and so this will be really critical for when we move to the roll cage because Sometimes, you know, we're going to be welding above our head. Sometimes we're going to be welding, you know, in, in weird, crazy spots. And so this was really good practice for Daddy. You know, he first tried to do it from outside the car, just looking down. And it ended up being really hard because it was, you know, the angle he was working from was causing blowouts and all that kind of stuff. So he found it was actually most effective to get inside the car, lay down, and, and work across it this way. So just a good reminder to always work from the angle that is most effective. Try some different things. And, you know, this will be good learning for us going forward as we have to start welding the actual roll cage. All right, and here's some details on the machine we're using. We're using this uh, amazing new Miller Multimatic 220. This machine's so great, makes it so easy, and it's really idiot proof, which I 
uh, really, really enjoy, you know, taking on a project of this size. It really takes a lot of the guesswork out. And uh, it's helped us deliver some really great results considering at least my personal experience level. Um, but essentially from where we've been working, um, you know, or I should say what settings we're using, obviously every machine is different and every machine on different, uh, you know, power lines or, or circuits will be different because of the changes and you know in the you know the quality of electricity and the voltage coming from the to the house and all that kind of stuff but generally what we would do is we would try to figure out what gauge metal we were working with and then we would use the auto select to say you know okay we're working with 20 we're working with 18 we're working with 16 etc and then we'd make finite adjustments depending on what kind of stuff we were saying sometimes we would add two tenths of a volt sometimes we would you know add five to the wire speed, stuff like that. Just make minor adjustments based on what we were seeing. You know, you needed a lot of adjustments during this seam welding because sometimes you would have two 20 gauge pieces uh, that you were welding together. Sometimes you'd have a 20 gauge overlapping a 16 gauge. I, it was just bonkers and all over the place. So you really, really had to be on top of you know how thick the metal you thought you were working with was and adju make adjustments. You know, when we would go like up the transmission tunnel in the back part of the transmission tunnel we had to go all the way up to 20 gauge because the metal was stretched and it was super thin and then even then we had to pull some some heat out of it to keep it from blowing it out so had to make tons of adjustments there if your machine doesn't have that and and it has you know a um, a matrix like this that you can use a table that you can use a matrix based on shielding gas type uh, wire type wire size and and um, thickness material thickness that you know will get you in a really good spot and then you can just make adjustments from there at least that's what we were doing So one of the things you can really see here underneath the car, we're just having major, major issue, issues with contamination. And that's why we were getting the, the pops and the bangs and you see all those sparks flying around. So we really had to work on burning through it. And fortunately here, the metal wasn't uber, you know, incredibly thin. So we could work through it a little bit more than some of the other areas where it's so thin, you just can't, there's nothing you can do. You just blow right through it. But here we were able to kind of get a puddle started We'd hit one of those sections and it would it would pop and you know it sputter and you would just kind of go past it and then back over it and that gave us pretty decent results all right so let's do a progress report we're making some really really good headway we're now at the point where the entire body has been prepped and is ready for welding so i have no more grinding or sanding or prepping of the seams to do we're now just at the point where we're welding and we've made really good progress on that as well the entire interior is now all welded and ready to go. And then we are pretty decent of a pretty decent amount of the way through the exterior. So actually, if I go over here, we can see I have this wheel well entirely ready to or entirely done, including the you know the outside part of it, but this is all seam welded. And then just today we just finished up. Let's see if I can get you good visibility. Um, so t just today we just got done seam welding this um, underside so we're in pretty good shape under here so all we have left really is just the frame rails and the transmission tunnel going forward the rear wheel wells and the front area you know the the engine bay because we already did the the rear back here and got this done so all right, so this has been quite the interesting process full of a lot of learning. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I decided not to acid dip the car because I didn't want to have to repaint the whole thing and I didn't think we were being good. You know, initially when I started, I didn't quite think we were going to go this far. Um, you know, obviously I would have acid dipped the car if I could start over because I wrecked the paint and I already, you know, it would have just been a lot easier prep. But another, th another point to that is if you're not acid dipping the car, you still have contamination between these two layers of metal and it can be really, really hard to get it cleared out. And um, 
you can see here we had areas where the welds worked pretty good and then we had areas where the welds worked less effectively and this if, if you look it's because we're having a lot of blowout and you know i think these ones are a really good example where we have a lot you know these have been cleaned up but you can see this black area is where a lot of stuff burned you know the contaminations so look how this one has more black smoke than say this one which is a lot cleaner and this welds a lot better so it's been very interesting learning process learning process for us because the welding this thin metal with contamination is really really difficult it's really hard to get a consistent uh, weld throughout the entire bead um, we're just having a, a really fun time trying to pull that off and then as you can see when we get to the thicker stuff it actually gets a lot easier the welds are a lot cleaner um, this is I believe 16 gauge and there's multiple layers stacked together so you can really put a lot of heat into this burn through it if you need to and it's not too uh, risky but this stuff here you know this is 18 to 20 gauge depending on where on the car you are and it's really really easy to burn through so you have to move very quickly but that means you also have to find the right balance of uh, burning through any junk any contamination but not burning through you know blowing out the metal so it's definitely been an interesting process all right so all right. as we as reach, we reach the, the bottom stretch of the... here you know dad and i were getting pretty comfortable and pretty good about where to set the machine and what technique to use depending on where on the car we were and these welds really did turn out really good it's so unfortunate they're on the bottom of the car where you can't see them but you know from an ease of access and and stuff we really want to start on the inside of the car because the the areas we were welding and how we were welding were so much easier um, but unfortunately our best welds are pretty much you know inside the uh, or underneath the car in the engine bay but by this time we had really figured it out you know when to turn it up a little bit because you need to burn through some stuff and you had you know the right amount of material um, thickness there or when you had to turn it down because you were creating a puddle that was you know a little too hot and it was blowing the metal out if you, you even moved just the tiniest bit too slow so we were getting really really comfortable by this point all right, so that is going to do it for this episode. It was a ton, a ton of work. I'm happy to be on the other side of it. So I put in probably about 100 or so hours. My dad put in probably 40 to 50. You know, we've been working on this pretty much nonstop for a little over two and a half weeks. So it's been a ton of work. Um, definitely put a lot of long hours deep into the night, um, you know, after work and stuff like that. I'm really happy to be moving on past this point. I don't think it's going to get any easier. But at least we'll get to go start on something new. So... You know, the, the welds turned out really interesting. You know, when we could get it clean enough, the welds looked great. And when we couldn't get it clean enough, the welds uh, looked like crap. And some of that, there was literally nothing I could do no matter how much I tried to prep it from my end, whether I heated it, I scraped it, I, you know, wire wheeled it, whatever. I just couldn't get them clean enough. And so the welds kind of came out bumpy or sometimes they blew out, stuff like that. But um, in the areas where we did get it prepped good, the, the welds came out great, and we learned a ton through it. You know, we, we learned uh, a ton about welding sheet metal, welding thin material, and making adjustments where, you know, we would, you know, turn down the voltage for areas where we would, it would be bent. You know, the, you know, the, the, the metal had been bent, uh, or formed, I should say, uh, versus, you know, areas that were flat, we knew had a higher thickness and, and density and stuff. So it was really, really good for us. Uh, Learn a ton. Really excited now to jump into the next parts of the welding project, uh, which will be coming up in future videos, stuff like the fuel cell, the roll cage itself, all that kind of stuff. But uh, thanks for, if you've made it this far into the video, thanks for uh, coming along with me. I hope, hopefully you learned some stuff. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them down below. If there's anything uh, you want to see in the upcoming videos as we get further into the project as always reach out to me Let me know comments work great here or you can find me on Instagram at honey badger shenanigans. All right. Peace Whew. Let me tell you so this one was a serious amount of work um, I think I have about a hundred hours into just what went on in this video meaning prepping the seams for welding and then doing natural welding and kind of all the stuff involved. And then I think my dad had about 40, 45 hours as well uh, on his own. And that was just done over the last, like I want to say about two and a half, three weeks. So it's definitely been a, a lot of work. Uh, I would definitely do it again, but I would much, you know, there would be no question I would never do this again without acid dipping the car. You know, if you're just doing, um, whew. Ooh, that was a serious amount of work. Um, so 
I have about a hundred hours, I want to say, into the work that was covered just in this video. And my dad, I think, had an additional 40, 45 hours or so. It took us well over two and a half weeks. Uh, I've worked out a lot of hours every day and, or pretty much every day. So um, I would definitely do it again. I'm really happy with the results. Uh, I can't wait to feel it on the racetrack. I can already tell it's stiffer just from the way, you know, it it work it interacts when I walk around it like get on an edge on the lift and we've we've had it tripoding off only three points pretty cool so I'm really looking forward to it if I were to do it again I think I would probably only do it if I could acid dip the car uh, I, I was really committed to to doing this uh, with the car still painted because I didn't want to have to repaint the ruby red but of course we lit the car on fire so uh, that's kind of all out the window but even then, assuming, you know, assuming I didn't light the car on fire, I still think I would have been, I would have rather have uh, done it by acid dipping the car because the content, I mean, we fought so many contaminants in so many of the joints. I want, I'd say, you know, a third of the joints were highly contaminated and, and made welding really, really difficult. Um, so, and I would say only half of the joints probably came out the way... Uh, I would have liked them to and that would have been so much easier if the car had been acid dipped and you just knew you weren't finding contaminants anywhere in the car plus I wouldn't have lit it on fire because the thing that would have the thing that caused the fire would no longer be there so I would like I would recommend acid dipping if this is something you're going to tackle in the future but of course you know as we as we found out it's totally capable of doing it without it so totally up to you all right, if you have any questions about this video, feel free to drop me a comment below or reach out to me at Honey Badger Shenanigans on Instagram, as well as if there's anything you want to see in the upcoming videos as we tackle things like the roll cage and the, you know, the, the fuel cell and all that kind of stuff and all the fabrication around that stuff, please drop me a comment as well. I'm happy to record what I can. Hopefully, I will be able to record uh, more of the process going forward because you know we won't have 100 plus hours into the, the stuff we're doing. All right, I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.